Okay, so taphonomy. Okay. And here we see the process of something dying and then becoming a rock. Okay, fossil. All right, so learning objectives for today. Understand what causes biases in the fossil record. Learn about different kinds of body fossils and create a hypothesis about other biases or hypos because I forgot to finish typing. All right, so first a question. Um, who knows what an ecological pyramid is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. So just how like plants and stuff are on the bottom, and then you have herbivores, and then the predators that eat herbivores. Yep. And right, so on land we see this. Look at like how much mass is in each of these levels. Lots of plants. You know, land is green. Some herbivores and a few predators. Right. On the ocean, it's inverted. Um, and on some lakes, some lakes are like this, and some lakes are like this. So there's an interesting ecological question of why, and people are working on that. Um, <coughs> but the big point I want you to realize is, on land, you typically can see this sort of distribution. Right? Okay. But here, you see something else. Right? So here are all dire wolf skulls pulled out of the red tar pits. Okay. So a lot of wolves, fewer herbivores. Why is that? Yeah. Exactly. Yep, this big truck, you get a big chunk of meat falls in, sit there, attracts many more carnivores, and then tritivores. Okay, they just get stuck in the tar. Good. So this is a bias, right? It's a bias that comes about from how these, how these fossils are formed, how these samples are collected. Okay, and so this would affect or try to figure out what paleoecology was. Okay, this would influence our results. Okay. So, for example, there was a big question years ago about were dinosaurs warm-blooded or cold-blooded? One bit of evidence we used was the proportion of herbivores versus carnivores, right? And, <coughs> you know, if you have warm-blooded things, you have many more herbivores than carnivores, but with cold-blooded things, it, it's less uneven, okay? And if you have something like this, it will completely throw off the results, right? Um, unless you could take that into account. So here's another case. So here is a guy, and he's standing around this huge assemblage of fossil bones. Okay, Dinosaur National Monument. Okay, and so the question is, how do all these bones get in one place? And so it could have been, you know, something that kept trapping dinosaurs. It could have been a flood that washed down many dinosaurs. Okay, and so they know what caused this. It was a case of flood, but that has biases too in terms of, you know, which bones do you find? If you have a flood, you don't find the light bones, they've been washed out to sea. You have heavier bones. Okay? Is that just a bias in what you find? Okay. So how do fossils form? Okay. So there's a short clip about that. It isn't easy to become a fossil. The fate of nearly all living organisms, over 99.9% .9 of them, is to compost down to nothingness. When your spark is gone, every <coughs> molecule you own will be nibbled off you or sluiced away to be put to use in some other system. That's just the way it is. Even if you make it into the small pool of organisms, the less than 0.1% that don't get devoured, the chances of being fossilized are very small. In order to become a fossil, several things must happen. First, you must die in the right place. Only about 15% of rocks can preserve fossils, so it's no good keeling over on a future site of granite. So think about these in practical terms, the deceased must become buried in sediment, where it can leave an impression, 
like a leaf in wet mud, or decompose without exposure to oxygen, permitting the molecules in its bones and hard parts, and very occasionally softer parts, to be replaced by dissolved minerals, creating a petrified copy of the original. Then, as the sediments in which the fossil lies are carelessly pressed and folded and pushed about by Earth's processes, the fossil must somehow maintain an identifiable shape. Finally, but above all, after tens of millions, or perhaps hundreds of millions of years hidden away, it must be found and recognized as something worth keeping. Only about one bone in a billion, it is thought, ever becomes fossilized. If that is so, it means that the complete fossil legacy of all the Americans alive today, that's 270 million people with 206 bones each, will only be about 50 bones, one quarter of a complete skeleton. Well, that's not to say, of course, that any of these bones will actually be found, bearing in mind that they can be buried anywhere within an area of slightly over 3.6 million square miles, little of which will ever be turned over, much less examined, it would be something of a miracle if they were. Fossils are, in every sense, vanishingly rare. Most of what is... Okay. So, he's put it down there. Um, so again, here's the process. Right, so you have to die in the right, the right place. Right? Okay. the water. Then you can fossilize. But then there's another filter of this to be discovered. Right? And so all these layers on top, um, until there's erosion of those layers, it wouldn't be found. Okay. And one thing actually paleontologists do is they'll find, you know, some fossil fragments. But it's not the only way. <coughs> so who knows what this is? Woolly Will mammoth. Yep. Yep. Freeze dried woolly mammoth. Okay. So in Siberia, woolly mammoths would be walking along and sometimes fall through cracks and ice, right? Caught in crevasses. Okay. And they'd die and be frozen there. And so periodically, thank goodness for global warming, ice is melting. And so these are being revealed. So they'll be periodically going out and they'll be spreading throughout a pine with exposed wood mammoths. Amber. So certain trees release a sticky sap. And in other right conditions, this can become fossil, this can become fossilized. So some of the amber you have in bees or whatever can contain fossils in it. Okay? Um, and so we see lots of insect fossils from there. There's pollen, there's little plant parts, there's even a lizard trapped in amber. Um, and I know this. <coughs> so that's where it's from fossils. Another way to fossilize is permineralization. Okay? And things as like pickling, okay? But with minerals rather than pickles. <coughs> Compression fossils, another one. Okay, so they often these flat. So this one would be good if you want to do a three D analysis of shape. But the two D shape has been very good. Another form is a cast or mold fossil. So imagine you have sediment forming and compacting, and then the actual thing inside gets destroyed. But you can then other rocks and fill in and become hard. Okay, so you can still see the cast. The problem with this kind of fossil is you don't get any information about internal structure, you just do the outside. Any questions about this? Okay. So here's a diagram showing these fossilization processes. So who so can explain it? Walk through it. Some could be recycling, yeah, they come into the bones, 
Some can be buried immediately, some be buried after a while. Why does the burial versus the delayed burial matter? Okay. All right. So um, we saw in the video yes uh, those of you who earlier before class yesterday saw in the little video how they were taking fish a fish head out of rock using acetic acid and vinegar. And those are all disassociated because they should decay before being fossilized. <coughs> you can also have you know scavengers fishing apart bones and walking away from them. So you probably Alright. Um, okay, so it can be exposed and you can put up the biosphere. I can find the things here, rocks. Okay. And they can be buried there or they can be exposed. Okay. Um, exposed to collect them, or they can be you know, broken up by other processes. Uh, or they can find the rock. Okay. And then some subset of those can become buckled. So each of these stages is just a filter. Bias. And so bias in this case doesn't mean bias in terms of I won't I won't hire people of that group. Bias is just <coughs> um, you know if I have group A and group B, I have group, group A at higher proportion. Okay, so it's not a sort of negative social bias. It's just in terms of a likelihood of, of sampling. Okay, so here we see two sand dollars, right, and then they become fossils. Okay. And this one, you know, is predated upon, and then goes to decay, and then it's articulated, and all these nasty things happen to it. It's fossilized, and these little pieces, okay. Versus this had, you know, no infestation when it was on the surface of the water and have things growing on it. So it's not very okay. So that might be well preserved. So those of you who saw fossils over here, kind of like this one, right? Were these fossils all from one time period? How big a time period is this all from you know, Tuesday, 20 million years ago? Is this from a month, a year? And so, it's it's sometimes it, it, so basically right exactly right it it varies so it can be in depends on sedimentation rate so if you're a Burgess shale you also have you know a, a, a slide of land capturing everything can be very instantaneous so that's a snapshot if it's <coughs> gradual deposition of mud through time you could have layers uh, mixtures of fossils that aren't you're separated by years or even longer okay. And so, <coughs> this shows that. So here's our li living community. Okay. <coughs> we have some things in high abundance, some things in low abundance. What does taxonomic durability mean? Mm -hmm. Right. So it would be something that you wouldn't expect to hold up. Well, jellyfish. jellyfish, right? What would what would hold up well? Trilobites, brachiopods, good. Yep, exactly. Um, <coughs> and so we have a single event that kills lots of things. You get sort of this random sample, right? Though it's then biased slightly toward the of durability. If you have a longer time average, you can get things that are more common. Present and more okay. You need to take this into account when you're looking at abundances. <coughs> okay, so here's some information about how long that time averaging is. Okay, so event beds, days to months. Okay, leaf litter, days to years, tens of years. Fluvial, so 
you know, rivers walking down sediment, you know, longer time periods. Caves. There's one of these big caves in the Caribbean where things pretty much just walk in, fall in, die. You know, a decade later, something else walks in, falls in, dies. It's this assemblage of things you, from this, you know, this long-term pitfall trap. And so, figuring out how, you know, so it's possible that things you find, um, you know, in one bed could have been, you know, hundreds of thousands of years apart from each other. Okay. So that's why you can't necessarily say, oh, look, that was fleeing that one. But they could have been. Good. Um, I know, I mean, part of it's based on current estimates of what's happening, so you can look at those definition rates. I don't know how else they do it, though. Anyone else know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, so yeah, I mean, so with radioactive decay, you can figure out proportions of things of time. Yeah. Good. Okay. And we see these assemblages happening today, too. So here's a beach in Britain with it's full of seashells. Okay. Um, so there's an assemblage of seashells, and they all from, you know, all shells that died today? No. The shells that died there for a long time, being, you know, aggregated. <coughs> okay. So I find, you know, a T Rex skull that's. This is 67 million years old. Okay. How long did the species live? Not in terms of the individual, you know, that lived 20 years or 30 years, but how long did Tyrannosaurus rex roam the Earth? Was it a million years? Was it 10 million years? Well, for a single, single fossil, it's hard to figure that out, right? Yeah. Um, and what people have done, though, is if you start getting multiple fossils, you can make an estimate. Right? <coughs> like I say, you know, how tall do people get? I can measure one person, you know, when it's a toddler, okay, you know, it's one estimate. But measuring more and more gives you more information about that. Okay? And so this is, I mean, you don't need to worry about the math. The, the math here, okay, which is very simple, you know, with the probability of a certain range given a certain amount of sample. Okay, so the way of generating an estimate of <coughs> what duration could be, and there's been more um, careful work since, more detailed work since then, using information like how big are the fossil beds, right? So if I have no fossils from a certain no fossils from a certain time period, then I can't say that nothing. They know that they have no data there, rather than information that's not there. Okay. This will come in really important later with phylogenetics too. Why do we care about this? So besides the phylogenetic part. Alright, so okay, so T X live for a million years or ten million years. Sure, okay, it's a number. Right. Why does that matter? So, you know, generating predictions, then that's a great example of generating a prediction and then going out and testing it, even though we can't directly experiment on T Rex anymore. So, it's going out there, remains. All right, that's good. Um, and people do want to, you know, when, when to see books from fossils. Why else does it matter? So the reason we have these geological periods is because Plankton has found 
these big changes in what we live from time periods to extinction. Is this to give us information about that? Good. What else? So remember the for those of you who saw the early intro video, extinction now is a hundred a thousand times faster than it used to be. Right? How do you know what it used to be? Alright, we can figure out, okay, so that T Rex species lived for ten million years and went extinct. Okay. So the expected time for extinction is ten million years. So those species lived one million years and went extinct. Okay. So you get an estimation of what extinction rate would be from that. And that gives us our background on this extinction rate. Great. And then you can look at how that changes through time. Oops. You know, for the dinosaurs, did it, did, was it constant and then KT happened, boom, and it shot up? Or did it gradually rise until they were all extinct? Okay. That tells us very different things about the processes involved. Right. So we, since we care about processes, being biologists, there's information about those. Um, it's also of note to know what was co-evolving. Right? So we see triceratops with their horns and neck frills. We find out that Triceratops evolved after all the large meat eaters went extinct. Then we say, okay, well, it can't be anti predator fence, it must be sexual competition. We know that they did co occur. We still don't know what the purpose of all those frills was. But it tells us information about who could be co evolving, what processes are going on. Another bias is um, <coughs> finding the right rocks. Okay. So here, Yellow is sedimentary rock, okay, where we have a chance of finding fossils. Of course, we're different eras, right? So some areas of Tennessee have Cretaceous rocks, some areas have Ordovician. Okay, you're not going to find a T-Rex in the Ordovician. Um, <coughs> and there's also volcanic rocks and metamorphic rocks and plutonic rocks. Okay, um, and so metamorphic rocks, rock, so metamorphic rocks been reworked, we're able to find some chemical traces of fossils. We're not going to find you know, a trilobite, a trilobite exoskeleton. Okay. So here's another case of taxonomic bias. So there's a mass extinction, okay, where you see all these groups seem to go extinct. Okay, because lack of lack of evidence. And this article is arguing that what actually happened was you just have no fossils from <clears throat> and we have pseudo extinction and Lazarus taxa. Sound cool. Right? What does it mean? So, pseudo extinction, so Pyergus, uh, Pythagoras, seems to go extinct, right? But then we know it has descendants. Right? So, it didn't go extinct here, and they wouldn't have been able to be So, it's sort of pseudo extinction. So, you might count it as extinction and a speciation, but this is a threat. And then there's tactic attack with the C Linux thing for a while, but then reappear. And this sort of thing is why doing phylogenies and paleontology is important, but it can also be really hard. Right? So is this the same thing as this or different? Another issue with pseudo extinction is you might they can maybe relate those. I mean, say this is Pygalus and this is this is the same thing. But the thing how can I put it? Wait, is this thing with different species or not? But there's different species one day it's going to go extinct and then two years it's going to go extinct and two years. It's not really what's happening. Linear self resistance is changing. That's pseudo extinction. Okay. All right. <coughs> this is an example of, you know, a critter that causes taphonon bias. So read this and figure out why. Ooh, no energy today.
That's what's going on here. Someone hasn't spoken yet. Right. How? Yep. So, gastropods are snails, right? And bivalves are things like oysters. Okay. Um, I wasn't going to tell you guys that, but I was teaching class where we are talking about sea otters and kelp. We forgot which was which. So, so <coughs> it's hard to see if you know a snail shell is empty. I mean, you could look around and see if it's having a perculum, so that little thing. But if you're a crab, you just crush it and see. Right? Whereas bivalve shell, if it's open, it's articulated, it's easy to see it's empty. And so this is bias caused by crabs crushing snail shells, right, and not bivalve shells. Even though, even if they're, so let's assume that crabs kill bivalves and gastropods in equal proportion. Right? What would the fossil record show us? Mm -hmm. Looks like they kill more snails, right? Because we see, you know, 80% of snail shells are crushed by crabs, but 10% of bivalve shells are crushed by crabs. Because the ones that snails have died of other causes are then their, you know, shells are then, after they're dead, they're still crushed by crabs, causing this bias. Okay. Another issue that happens is warping. Right? So, as you drive by the on the highway, you see rock cuts, right? Are the rocks always level? <clears throat> no. What's happened? Why aren't they level? I mean, rocks are hard, right? I mean, not that strong. I mean, I think right? Mm -hmm. So why aren't rocks and rocks deposited this way? How do they turn this way? So plate tectonics, or kind of plates moving around, right? It's a crazy idea. We're gonna hear a really cool song later in the year about this. Because we're gonna wait for that. Um, so <coughs> um, plates are always moving and pushing, and so things like the Himalayas. What's causing the Himalayas? India, right? So it needs to be its own um, sort of sub, own separate landmass, then slammed into Asia, right? It's cool to look at paleo maps and see that how fast this is happening. Right? And as a result of that, plates are pushing together and pushing up, actually, pushing up mountains, okay? So deforming the rock. Okay? And fossils in that rock are also being deformed and warped. Right? This happens on smaller scales than the Himalayas too. And so this trilobite right, has been, even if it's not a compression fossil and completely flat, it's still been transformed and shifted in shape. This in this processes, right? So you're trying to look at um, things like what's what's the volume of the internal inside of the organism, right? Or what's the angle that your eyes are facing? Right? If you look up the craters, look inside. Right? That can be affected by how it's been warped inside these processes. <coughs> okay. And this is a simple study comparing um, sand dollars found recently and sand dollars found fossil record. Right. Why would you bother doing this? All right, so comparing the specimens themselves, they can tell you about evolution of them, right? How about comparing um, the structure of the specimens, right? So, you know, number of cracks is not a function of what, what they're like now, it's a function of what's happened to them, right? Um, 
we mentioned is trying to figure out the processes that affect the the kind of energy you find. Right? So how much incrustation is it? So when they, when they die, they live do they their empty cases live on the uh, rest on top of the seabed where they can start growing on them, or are they buried quickly? Right? So you can see how quickly how does it happen with modern stuff by looking at the modern things and figure out compare that to these fossil beds. Mm -hmm. Um, so an example of uh, using coal deposit, okay, and so we want to figure out how, so this, we'll get to this sec, actually this really cool coal mine that has a forest, range of forest, and so people want to know how did this get fossilized. And so the hypothesis is that there is this river, right, okay, and then and then so we from, um, you know, it's going near the coast to being in the top water. Okay. And now in this coal mine, there's all these really great fossils of, or in other, in other plants. Okay. So you can walk through the coal mine and look at this forest and look at its structure. Okay. <coughs> and figure out what, what sort of plants were there. So it has, like, hopses in it. Which is sort of a different evolution of wood than woody plants we see today. Okay, so woody plants now have rings. Right, we sort of had wedges. And the good example is at McClung Museum, actually. Okay, and this one fossil site, you know, is pretty big. So here's an oxfield, right? And here's this estuary, this sort of map in this coal mine. Okay, so you can see how big this fossil site. It's not, it's, we're superimposing it, it's not actually under not so. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So there, you know, knowledge of how it formed gives information also about, you know, the structure of this estuary back, you know, hundreds of millions of years ago. Well, hundreds, yeah, hundreds of millions of years ago. Okay. There's more information that comes from taphonomy. I thought you'd get a chance to read this. Okay, so here we have a bunch of broken bones, right? So, okay, so we know what lives there. Okay, we find these. So there must have been large ungulates around. But we can tell more from that because how they were deposited. So they're all brought back to a site, right? Their preference is like selected for for being large bones, and the ones that are most marrow rich were preferentially broken. Okay, it's all consistent with scavenging behavior. You need to go out, find something to buy a sandwich with cat, bring it back, crack it open. Hyenas have one of the strongest bite forces in the natural world. Okay. You can crack through bone and get the marrow inside. Okay. <coughs> and so this shows something about agent hyena behavior just from how the bones are broken. So what I want to show you is, is like how fossils form and also to have enough biases. Okay. And so these biases can be a problem. So you can get mistaken understandings of like community trophic structure, because we have, because we have to sample lots of predators. Also get issues where we can actually discover new things from these biases, like hyenas or scavengers. Okay. So it has pluses and minuses. So biases aren't limited to fossil data. So what you're going to do is break them into a few in small groups and talk for a little while about what other biases in the data for all of macroevolutionary biology there might be and how this will affect us.
Okay, one minute. <laughs> okay. So let's go around now, uh, starting with this group. Some of the earliest ev evidence for evolution was like, you know, how do we get seashells and mountains? It's just a change within one part. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All in place, even somology. That's not when we get to that on Monday when we have our jargon lecture. Uh, Wednesday. Right. Let's not go to something that's pushing Syria this week. <coughs> okay. Uh, let's go around the back. We'll go back to the front. We had a problem with extant stuff, right? So, um, you know, matching up caterpillars to adult butterflies. The reason what you have to do is actually raise the caterpillar to a butterfly and then, you know, have them both and make them the same. Now you can use DNA to figure that out. But, you know, you have to go out and get the stuff, even now it's hard. I don't know, but I, I know theropods, many theropods did have uh, feathers. I'm not sure if, t I'm not, I don't know. I mean, I, plus, I saw that they didn't know about T Rex yet, but I'm surprised. Do you know better? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, don't, I, mean, I would totally want to be surprised if they did. Yeah. And through sort of a long tree, as things grow, they change shape. That's why babies are you know, cute, have big heads, and they're not cute, have smaller heads. Things change at different rates as you develop. And that could also be the state of the now it goes well with the towards our. I mean, often you can, but right, you get the exceptions. And then also, the more common are like discontinuities, right? So you have like, have all this sudden of rock building up, and then they're roaded down, and they get new sediment of rock. It's just this big time gap of stuff that's been washed away. <coughs> Good, yeah. That's yeah, good.
Do you remember that? I mean, the, the that sort of process like dinosaurs with the head back as, as ligaments construct. That's what all the dinosaur fossils do. They didn't walk around like that. You know. Yep. Yeah, like, you know, how did cuts evolve in, in West North America? Right. Yeah. And of course, there are natural dispersals, too. I mean, so, like, cattle egrets are now in North America, and they we think it's a natural dispersal in the old world. Right. So it does happen, but it's happening a lot more now. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of signal to go through time in basic species. Yeah, here. Um, so you sort of talked about how So in Texas, I'm going to talk about lumpers versus splitters. Do you really like, want to put every one group or split in separate group, groups? But also, there's incorrect lumping and as well. It's always sort of a matter of taste. And you bring up a good point. I mean, yeah, so we've been talking about sort of point estimates, like the rate's 100 fold higher, but there's an uncertainty measure on that. And so what you can do is say, okay, given these possible federational issues, how big is my uncertainty error? And what 
the last time. You know, then we find out that you know if the engine is here and the other computer is here. Okay, then we know that's outside. If it's you know here, and we have to try to Yeah, and as far as the mixing of the planes, I mean, that can happen. So we find that the Neanderthal is buried in you know sedimentary rock because someone buried it, you know, made a grave, and so we will often account for that if they can, but. Um, other issues that come up in science are sort of publication bias, mm -hmm. right? So <coughs> I have 30 years left and I die, or you know, leave, or retire, or whatever, right? What do I work on in that time? And I can come up with something that's turning out to be boring. Like, oh, yes, you know, gravity still happens. You know, um, you know, yep, carnivores eat herbivores. Got that? And I can not publish that, and then I'll publish something that's weird or different instead. Okay? Or negative results often people don't publish. So you get a bias that way. Um, <coughs> and so we've talked about this in general, but like sort of ascertainment bias is this thing where you study what you can get and that what you get could be a bias sample, right? So the thing you like to use is um, do dolphins save drowning sailors, right? So we have all these stories of people who, you know, were drowning at sea and dolphins pushed them and they came up on land, right? We don't hear from those stories as though people the dolphins pushed the other way. <laughs> right, <coughs> and so it could be the dolphins only push people towards land. It could be they push them ninety percent of the time towards water and you know make someone make a mistake and let them survive. It could be fifty-fifty, right? So the fact that all you talk to the survivors that induces a bias, okay? just like Teflon does. Okay, that comes up in genomics and things like that all the time. <laughs> all right, I'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>